we are pleased to, uh, once again to host the Critical Mass Stimulus Award exhibit. Uh, we were a hosting site once before in 2012, so it's exciting to have this really amazing work here in our galleries. Uh, this year's exhibit was curated by uh, Carly Trostclair, who was a 2013 Critical Mass Award winner. This evening you will hear from our three award or awardees, Tate Foley, David Johnson, and Mel Watkin. We'll give short presentations on your work. Feel free to ask questions throughout the talks. And then after the talks, the 2015 winners will be announced, and we will follow with a short reception upstairs on the second floor. So I'll start with Tate, uh, who will begin. Tate Foley was born in Millerton, a small rural town in north central Pennsylvania. He currently, <laughs> currently works as an assistant press professor of art at Webster University in St. Louis. Ooh. <laughs> and he's a comedian on the side. He received his BA in studio art in 2007 from Lycoming College in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and his MFA in printmaking in 2010 from the Lamar Dodd School of Art at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. His work has been recently exhibited in New York City, Washington, D.C., Portland, St. Louis, and Cleveland, and is in the permanent collections of the Toledo Museum of Art and both Yale University and Reed College Libraries. And next will be David Johnson, who received his MFA in Visual Art from Washington University in St. Louis in 2007 and earned his BFA in Studio Art with an emphasis in photography from Texas Christian University. His photographs have been exhibited internationally and his work can be found in the collection of the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago. Johnson is recipient of a Gateway Foundation Great Rivers Visual Arts Award in 2011, with a featured exhibit at the Contemporary in, in St. Louis in 2012. He is a lecturer at Washington University in St. Louis and at St. Louis University. Then uh, finally, but uh, last but not least, uh, Mel Watkin, whose solo exhibitions include <laughs> That, <laughs> Franklin Furness, New York, Illinois State Museum, Chicago, Hyde Park Art Center, Chicago, and the Missouri Botanical Garden and Phillips Line Gallery in St. Louis. Her work can be found in the permanent collections of the Spencer Museum of Art in Lawrence, Kansas, the Museum of Modern Art Library in New York, Special Collections of New York Public Library, and Fine Arts Library at the Fogg Museum of Art at Harvard University. Watkin has been awarded three grants from the Illinois Arts Council and a Paula Krasner Foundation Fellowship. She was also commissioned to create a public artwork for Lambert um, St. Louis International. So without further ado, help me welcome Tate Foley. I'm going to stand awkwardly around this area <laughs> the whole time. But, hi, I'm Tate. Um, I want to thank Olivia here at Sheldon. I want to thank BJ and Ray Critical Mass and Carly for doing all the organizing and curating for the show. Um, I think all three of us, the artists, were out of town for a lot of it, and so uh, we had to rely on other people to do a lot of the work. But um, but thank you all. But thanks for coming. Can everybody see the screen? <laughs> I could also stand over here in front of David. Is that better? Can I see what's happening? It's equally yeah. awkward. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted to start this by just kind of setting up things that are kind of like these constants in my work, uh, things that I go back to when um, I feel inspired or feel encouraged to make art. Um, a big thing is advertising and advertisements. I like news media. Um, I like product design, packaging design. Um, and I really like the psychology of advertising too, and we'll talk about that more as a lead into the work you see here. My work is like this wall to the back. You're not cool now. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, just so you know. Um, this is a book that I did in 2014 called Buy American. It was like a lookbook or a product catalog for products that America could start selling um, as a way of boosting the economy. So I was taking these images from good housekeeping magazines. I found a few really great good housekeeping magazines from 1956. And in those, all the ads in the good housekeeping magazines, it's like a requirement that you put a little terribly printed four color half-toned image of the product that you were also selling. So you couldn't lie to us about the product you were selling. So I took those, blew them up, I changed the text on them to 
to talk about these new products that America could sell. Um, I hit the button, but I'm going to wait. Some of my images are pretty large. So I can pay for it. Um, uh, also, just taking things um, and kind of twisting the text on them to kind of mean a new thing, contemporize them in a way um, that, uh, that has some sort of phrase that is more pertinent to our culture, our, our uh, current times. So these are these oil barrels or oil drums that I found. Uh, we don't really buy oil in cans anymore when we go to um, AutoZone to buy oil for our car. Uh, but these kind of reference barrels more, but I was, of course, thinking about that same imagery, um, stealing in part some of the actual products like shell oil, um, but then changing the text to, to mean something new entirely. So that's kind of what I go back to. I really love advertisements of all kinds. The, my newest work, can you see this piece from 2015? If you can't read that, that's fine. Just ask a question. Um, <laughs> my, my newest work has been like, uh, extracting and collecting, kind of dissecting advertisements from all different places and trying to understand how the language is so similar across the board. Um, it doesn't matter what the product is, advertisers know how to sell a product to anybody. Um, and it's all usually with the exact same language, which is pretty great. These are all from older comic books. Um, this is another spread from the same publication I'm working on, but now here the, the language of the advertisements has actually been removed. So a, a lot of things that I deal with in my work, you know, kind of see, that's kind of all the old work I have, but I'll, in some of the work that's here on display, sometimes I deal with language and changing the language, sometimes I just plain out, extract the language or edit it out so you can only focus on the visuals of the piece. So um, if you can imagine in comic books, these were all like ads for making your muscles bigger overnight, and stuff like that, x-ray specs, um, and those types of things. Um, but actually, taking the language out, now I'm, I'm trying to understand like how the aesthetics of advertising is working as well. So where this one was more a, a dissection of all the language from all different ads, um, this one more of understanding the visuals and how it's laid out. Uh, when I got this award, of money to make work. Um, <laughs> I really started um, attracting to uh, trading cards, specifically non-sport trading cards. So there's this whole, this whole culture that was running underground in my lifetime. Um, I was a baseball card collector, so um, I never collected Cardinals cards. Um, but I was a baseball card collector my whole childhood, and it wasn't until like going back I could see that like there was a trading card pack or a trading card set made for literally everything. Um, I'm going to show a couple pictures of, pictures of those. So I was trying to understand like how trading cards were used to advertise a product. Here, trading cards being used to advertise Jaws 2, which literally nobody saw in theaters. Um, so, my God, um, and so uh, this is one thing that I really started to try to. So I bought this pack of these Jaws 2 trading cards. Um, and we'll look at some other trading cards too, but I thought it was really interesting um, in the aesthetic beauty of these, the overall kind of quality of the package, it as an object, like I love the idea of collecting trading cards, I really like objects, and so seeing this, and uh, I am a printmaker, and so understanding how this was printed and how it was made, I'm, I'm really interested in that. So how much of your grant did you spend? <laughs> <laughs> All of it <and> more. <laughs> Uh, I, bought, I bought about uh, 125 packs of trading cards. They were a dollar a piece on eBay. Um, especially these non-sport trading cards, really nobody cares. Um, and they just made so many of them and then they went nowhere. Um, so here's this one. Um, but I've always been interested in trading cards and that idea. I love the objectness of them. This is a piece I actually showed at the Hunt Gallery at Webster uh, in 2011. It's actually a 1990 Topps uncut trading card set. So these are all printed using offset lithography, um, all on one sheet, and then of course they were trimmed down later and put into packs at random. But this is the full set. Um, they don't release the edition number, so I don't know how they can assign value to these, but pretty much you can't. This, this uncut sheet um, was sold to me under the idea that this is worth a lot of money because it hasn't been cut yet. Um, and of course, right before I framed it, 
I looked on eBay and these uncut sheets from 1990 were going for about $5 plus shipping. <laughs> the frame is definitely worth more than the object in it itself, which I thought was, was very interesting. Um, but this made me wonder if I could start you know, printing my own trading cards. These were printed uh, at the University of Kansas uh, last semester. I say semester because I'm not academic. Last fall. Um, this is just a two-color lithography lithograph on uh, Stonehenge in like this nice copper color and this green color. Kind of thing about Boy Scouts. Um, but I, I sat down and just tried to draw as many iterations of fire as I could, as many times as that showed up. And, and even thinking like, wh why do we collect sports cards? What about them attract us? I was attracted to these because I really like drawing fire. I think I've always really liked drawing fire. It's like endlessly interesting. Um, for me to draw and kind of think about. Here's a couple details. So very, very like basic format, perforated all these prints um, in the edition, and giving like the, the purchaser the ability to fold them and tear them all up if they want to. Somebody has done that, it's pretty cool. It's like a nice little set. Um, these are other ones that I paid uh, later on in the fall. Um, this card set is called How Lazy Guys Get Ripped. Um, it's all these different ways of like these infomercials and things that I'm sure you've all seen to try to sell you uh, get skinny quick kind of schemes. Uh, seaweed soap in, my, in the upper left right corner is probably my favorite. Anybody remember the electro belt? <laughs> the thing that would shoot you with electric pulses in your abdomen so your muscles would? I'm sure it ended up giving horrible results in the long run. Really interested then in like understanding, apart from these, like how the aesthetics, how the visuals are working into building up like the, the, the desire to buy these trading card sets. Is it the content? You know, do you feel something with the content? Did anybody in here buy seaweed soap? Anyone raise their hand? And, okay. Um, so <laughs> understanding like is it the content that attracts you to this object or is it the aesthetics that, that attract you to this concept? No new idea by any means, just trying to understand how those two things work together. Um, through purchasing all these, this is not a trading card pack, the print is actually uh, right over here, but uh, through purchasing and looking for all of these trading cards, I really started to become attracted to the back sides of them as a way of relinquishing the language of the front. So like you don't know what this trading card pack is for, you don't know the content, but you can understand the, the visual like appeal of this, um, or at least it was visually appealing to me. And then of course I love that on the back of this trading card pack, they put an advertisement for another product. Um, and it, it goes on to, everybody knows Super Bubble, everybody knows Bazooka Joe, and Bubble Bubble. So these, all these bubble gums are actually owned by trading card companies. So Topps own Bazooka Joe, Fleer own Double Bubble, and I think uh, this is Don Russ, they own Super Bubble. So they actually made that gun to go in the packages. But that'd be like this thing that they market alongside, and it's like, man, we can get somebody to buy this nice product and also buy this advertisement. Um, it's pretty genius, I think. Um, so I was really attracted to the backside of these. You guys don't know what these trading cards are for necessarily. Um, they're for this TV show that ran for like three days called Space 1066, which sounds really great. Um, but, uh, but I was really interested in the small like bits of imagery you get on the bottom side or on the left side of this, but also the advertisement of the, the product that they wanted you to buy alongside. Um, I think that's really nice. Blows larger bubbles, sure. If I'm 12 years old, that's why I'm going to buy bubble gum. I don't have a lot of editing for bubble gum, but that would be one thing that sold me. Um, so I traded, is there a question or is that one of my children? No question. Um, uh, so this became a print then. We started kind of uh, taking away a lot of the detail of the outside of the packaging, the folds, and tried to start breaking them down into these flats of color. This is a risograph. Um, which I'm going to go into a little bit of that process later, if you're unfamiliar. Um, but all those prints hanging up there are risographic prints, so I'll talk about that very briefly. Um, but I was really understanding that, like, focusing on, like, the visuals and, and the advertisement together. Um, and sometimes just the visuals. With this piece, um, it's not necessarily an advertisement in the most traditional sense. These are actually Desert Storm trading cards, which I just think is a unbelievable idea that uh, war had trading cards. 
Um, but really, well, it's a really beautiful trading cards. They have camo, Desert Storm camo around the borders. They have like these pictures of Salt Bombers, which was like my favorite thing for a couple years when I was a kid. Um, but on the back, not instead of an advertisement, they just have this one little banner that says Coalition for Peace, which I just think is a really interesting idea. It's kind of like an advertisement for an idea about the war, which I think is really interesting. And everybody knows what these are. Um, but I love that like the, the trading card pack is advertising the next pack coming out. So you'd like buy your package of Garbage Pail Kids, you open up a little and be like, oh man, I can't wait till August when the next, the next series of these things come out. And we're alive and grosser than ever. Like, I love that language. Like, you should buy these because they are grosser than ever. <laughs> Once you think you know all about garbage field kids, just wait till August. Um, so I really like those ideas, and that's that's where those these rizzes came from on the side. Um, that that I this is a really weird image, I understand, uh, but it's going to become crystal clear in one second. Um, so, all these prints I've done on the side, I said, are printed with a Rizzo duplicating machine. It's actually a stenciling duplicating machine. Now, uh, I'm going to flip back here for a second. And the reason I really was attracted to um, trading cards like this Jaws one um, is because of really how poorly printed it is. It's really beautiful in the quality that it's, it's quite poorly printed. Um, these traps which are called here um, to kind of like make sure there's no white space in between the yellow and the blue where it meets. That yellow goes under the blue print. Um, it is really large and chunky. The blue didn't cover it up perfectly. So you get this like tertiary color mixed in between. I really love that, that idea. You guys can probably see it too around the jaws too. You have like this darker maroon band around all of it. Even the half tones and the legs, these red half tones are really outside the lines. And uh, But that really wasn't that really wasn't the plan to make like this perfectly fine art print with these trading cards. These things were being sold for, you can see, 15 cents. So they're quite cheap, um, of course had to be quite cheaply produced as well. Um, so this machine that I, I made these prints on is uh, a Rizzo stenciling machine. Um, it actually makes a stencil and then runs soy-based ink through the stencil using centrifugal force to apply ink to the print. Um, it only prints one color at a time. So for the prints up here that you're seeing that are four colors or more, you just have to run those sheets through the, the printer four times. Um, and this is just a really awkward photo of two people dining over one of those machines. <laughs> um, this is a really great uh, gift that you kind of get the idea. So here, I'm going to try to use a laser printer. So here's like the color drum. This is printing red now. Um, a stencil actually goes onto this large drum here, and as paper shoots through at an incredible rate, 100 prints a minute, um, it, it applies the red ink in specific areas, much like a screen print. Um, but ink is very transparent, and so it provides that kind of offset litho quality that I was really trying to go for with the original packaging. Um, and probably I could show those packages, and everybody knows like, the feel when they're wax packages. Um, so they don't really pick up the ink perfectly anyways, which I think is kind of nice. Um, but I like that, that those places in these prints where I was able to get like a tertiary color of the, of the magenta and the cyan mixing to form purple. Um, so that's, if I ever say Rizzo again, you all know what that means. So back here again, thinking about this, so this is a three color print that I had to run through the machine three times um, to print the red, the black, and the yellow. Um, these are actually for uh, Michael Jackson trading cards. So there's yeah. the um, five minutes? Okay. Yeah. Go along. Uh, Michael Jackson trading cards, which I think is great. Uh, I don't know why. Three super gloss photo cards, three stickers, and one sticker bubble gum. That is the reason why I don't know. And then Growing Pains trading cards. I don't know who owned these. They're all over eBay. Um, one of my colleagues at Webster really is a huge Growing Pains fan. I'm not going to say who it is, but like I, I showed this person. I showed this person these trading cards and flipping through them, and there was a sticker of Jason Seaver playing guitar. I don't know why anybody would want that. I don't know like what the original like like uh, demographic of selling these two was. Or even why you need to use Growing Pains, to or these cards to advertise Growing Pains. Very interesting. Um, more. Really great ones. Johnny Depp. So good. 21 Jump Street trading cards. Really great. Um, moving along. 
this was a piece, I mean, it's pretty obvious to see where this piece came from. I had all these trading cards. They all had an old moldy stick of bubble gum in them. Um, and I was trying to understand, I knew that I wanted to keep these things. Most of them fell apart and broke into a million pieces. I knew I wanted to keep these things to kind of reintegrate somehow, but I didn't know what that exactly was going to look like. Um, and so I decided to vacuum seal them as a way to like preserve their freshness. <laughs> um, so beyond expiration. <laughs> but uh, even thinking about the idea of repackaging a product, I think is really nice. I love that there was always a stick of bubble gum in these trading cards where it's like, if buying the cards isn't enough, spend five cents and get a stick of bubble gum. Um, and I really like that idea. I'm really thrown off by the changes in color. Um, I think that's really weird. Um, but there's some detail shots of these. Um, I think this is the last slide I have to show. These are Presto Magic's transfers. Um, I got these at a really old, old, old um, kind of everything shop down in Georgia, on a really back road in Georgia. Um, they're actually these transfers that you actually you scrape with a pencil on the back side and they transfer to whatever you're putting them on. Um, these sets, which were ET sets, um, actually came to this great landscape, this beautiful watercolored landscape of a scene from the movie. So of course you're supposed to transfer like E.T. you know, and all these, these things throughout the landscape. Um, but I really like the idea of just putting the whole transfer sheet in a single piece of white paper and just transferring all the images as is right there on the white paper. Um, just to kind of like reclaim the authority of the product. Like so many of these landscapes that they had painted had like um, uh, the main character on the bike riding with a blanket over his basket. And you were supposed to like transfer E.T.'s face right there in the basket of the bike, right? But I think I, I really like love the, the the son or daughter that would grab this and like transfer it in the weeds, like he was peeking out. Like go against the grain of what the product was intended to be, to be used for. I really like that idea. One thing I didn't talk about, but I can, I can say briefly, those rings in the back, um, the big wood pieces are just borders from trading cards, various trading cards that I found. So again, thinking about that idea of taking out the content, what is there left to sell um, the, the product if the content is missing, really just the visuals. Um, but I really fell in love with all those things. That's it. Back to that. Thank you. <laughs> Howdy, y'all. Uh, I just got back from Texas on Thursday, so I apologize because I'm just getting back into my Midwestern home. Um, So today I'm going to talk to you all about the work that's here. Uh, it can be this way always, which is actually uh, a sign or a slogan, which is actually on the printer on the corner, uh, about the Kerrville Folk Festival. Um, kind of a backstory: the Kerrville Folk Festival is an 18-day long music festival in Kerrville, Texas, two hours southwest of Austin. Uh, started in 1972 by a producer and race car driver named Rod Kennedy and Peter Yarrow from Peter, Paul, and Mary who actually plays every year on this festival, and each musician gets like a 45 minute set, um, and Peter Yarrow plays Puff the Magic Dragon for 35 minutes. Um, and it's not about smoking uh, drugs. Uh, and he makes everybody know that. But um, it's an 18 day long festival um, that I've been photographing now for the last uh, eight years. Several musicians, uh, David Cosby played this year, Peter Paul and Mary's, I've seen them play Indigo Girls, several musicians, I love it, Robert Old King, have gotten their careers started at the Folk Music Festival. Um, I started photographing this right after graduate school. I've been working on a project for three years dealing with kind of office culture and the environments of, of cubicle culture, um, especially during the economic recession during the early or late 2000s. Uh, and I started going as just a practice. Um, I had been going for three years just as a uh, participant, enjoying the music and enjoying the party. Um, but I started going to really understand how to work portraiture, because I've been photographing these kind of um, abstract architecture 
uh, environments, and I kind of lost my chops as far as trying to tell a story and trying to look at uh, individuals within a specific environment. So this is actually one of the first photographs that I was able to make my first year while photographing on the ranch. And I really love the idea of the environment. And, and it's more about this idea of community than the main state centers. But it takes uh, a village to create this environment. There's um, ticket buyers, but it's also a volunteer-run festival. Most of the volunteers can come in for free. Uh, they get two square meals, free camping, free music, two free beers, two Cokes, and two bags of ice every day. Um, but the way that people kind of set up their sites with tents, um, the fact of the environment, and it's on a 50-acre ranch called Quiet Valley Ranch, uh, and that kind of changes, but also the fact that it is kind of a place where people come back to the earth, and it's kind of uh, nostalgic of like utopian and uh, communities, but still hippies need their electricity and their water, and I'm not sure if this is up to code. <laughs> uh, but uh, in the same respects as I was looking at um, offices and more recently arts institutions of how people kind of prescribe their spaces. I was interested in people how they set up their 18 day home. This is Zoid's camp and what Zoid does when he sets up his camp is on his drive down from Denton he stops at junk shops and buys a piece of artifact on his way down to build um, kind of his home where he stays at uh, for the 18 days. Uh, the individuals and the stories that they have or the people that you kind of run into. This is Spider. And uh, Spider is what people at Kerrville lovingly call a ranch rat. He kind of has lived there almost his whole life since the festival's begun. He now lives off the ranch because you're not allowed to live on the ranch. But early in the 80s and 90s, it was kind of a place for outlaws to live when the festival wasn't going on. Uh, the night that I met Spider, uh, six years ago, uh, I was walking to a friend's campsite to go listen to music. And he was walking up with a machete and the hindquarters of a deer that had been roadkill 30 minutes earlier, and he smoked the venison meat and served to uh, the community later. This year, though, was fun. He drove by in a golf cart with a wild boar uh, and a cage on the golf court and said that he was going to cook and smoke this hog again. Um, but some of the vegetarians on ranch decided that it was problematic, and they actually stole the golf cart and freed the hog. <laughs> Um, uh, we'll see that, and, and, and most of those work, those are some early work where I was using color film. Um, I recently transitioned to black and white uh, for two reasons. One, because it's practical. Uh, color film, you have to keep cold. And I found that I was staying more and more, instead of photographing for a weekend, I was photographing for 12 days, uh, for 18 days, for 23 days, and I just got back from being there for 22 days on ranch. So keeping color film was uh, not possible on a cooler in the Texas heat. Question? Yeah. Film, yes. Okay. All black and white film. 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 The real stuff. The real stuff. <laughs> um, so I, uh, it was a practical, practical choice, but I also realized when I started using it that it was also going back into this idea of nostalgia and timelessness that we were able to look at. Um, folk music is kind of this interesting thing where it's had several resurgence in the 1920s as people were moving out west. Um, uh, and, and kind of the radio shows that were going on, the 1960s with Pete Seeger and Bob Dylan going down for civil rights, uh, and more recently in just popular culture, folk music and string bands have come back and play. Uh, so there is this real nice timelessness and nostalgia. Uh, the biggest thing for me about this festival is this idea of community, um, and that it takes a village, and, and, and people come in and really celebrate this festival. I have a lot of friends that will leave the ranch, work for 11 months, quit their job, and camp there for another month. Um, and this is actually uh, one of the permanent structures. There's very few permanent structures on ranch, and this is called Kids Built, where you can kind of check your kid in and let them play with other uh, children throughout the day while you go work or go practice or go write a song. Uh, but every Saturday at 4 o'clock, they have two step and square dancing lessons. Um, and the idea of community, uh, the backstory is uh, uh, standing right here in the striped shirt. I set this camera up, and I really love how. Um, you know, people were walking in a circle on the structure, but he's kind of set up right in the middle of my shot, and I wasn't going to ask him to move quite yet. And then this couple with the cowboy hat came up, uh, and they had their child on a stroller, and they were kind of wanting to dance, and he looked over and notices this, let me dance with your baby so y'all can dance. So, you know, uh, and they were okay with that. Uh, granted, they're like five feet away the entire time. Uh, but that idea of, of, of allowing kind of this, um, Loose hardness and, and, and uh, 
flexibility uh, was really interesting to me, especially now in our culture where it seems like, you know, as I grew up as a child, I you know, could go out in the neighborhood and now it seems a little bit more um, worried about security and whatnot. Uh, another great thing about the festival is there's not a huge number of large bands. A lot of the musicians that come in um, not only perform one night at the main stage, they'll also stay for several weeks uh, or several days and perform. Uh, and a lot of times they'll come down in the meadow where everybody's playing and they'll play a song or they'll have another show uh, that really allows you to kind of get to know their music. And um, one of the greatest things is uh, I was watching a, what we call campfires where everybody kind of circles up. And there's Peter Yarrow and several other kind of main stage musicians and this one 16-year-old uh, um, guy was playing a song and it was like the first song you wrote and it was about to break up and it was a bad breakup and this girl broke his heart. And then next thing you know there's a bass and there's a fiddler and there's a mandolin player and uh, everybody's singing three part harmonies with him. So his first song was to uh, these kind of uh, extremely famous well-known writers and then they went back and they said let's do that again what if we add this third verse? And so he co-wrote a song with Peter Yara, one of his heroes. Um, but also in that, it's not only a festival, um, but it's also this professional development conference where a lot of times um, uh, most of these musicians are traveling or touring 200 to 300 dates a year. Uh, they're always on the road. This is the only time that they have to spend with their colleagues uh, and write songs and, and deal with their profession. Uh, during the midweek, so it's three weekends, and during midweeks there is continuing education for uh, music teachers. There's uh, bluegrass lessons. Um, this is Cassie. She's from New Orleans, and she's building a geodesic dome. The infrastructure. Uh, you know, a lot of times my work deals with architecture and how personalities function through this space. Well, there is no architecture on this 50, 50 acre ranch, so everybody kind of creates their own geodesic domes. People bring in teepees. Um, people bring in Winnebago's. Uh, the campsites come themes, and there's this specific culture within each campsite. Um, a lot of times when we think about this festival, three years ago it became a nonprofit, and the ranch that it's on is now a nonprofit, which is a really kind of interesting change to uh, how music festivals are really in vogue right now, and they're very profit-driven uh, motives, and the fact to keep this alive is volunteer uh, Oriented. There's no sponsors. The only two sponsors are Texas Monthly Magazine and uh, Lone Star Beer, but you won't see their logos on the main stage. Uh, so it gets away from a little bit more of a corporate entity. Um, campsites. Uh, a big part of the culture of the festival is um, understanding which campsite that you can go to and what's going on. This is Honky Tonk, uh, and you'll see nobody's around during Honky Tonk because it's the daytime. Honky Tonk is the place that you go to if you're like 22 and you really want to get your party on. Um, there's other uh, campsites. This is Camp Bungie, which is the premier hippie retirement community, which is just below my uh, campsite. Um, and they actually have this massive tarp that's about 100 feet yard long, and they use thousands of bungees to hold it down with these different, different tin sticks. Um, another uh, place where I go and hang out is Leopard Lounge, where they actually have a full bar with a leopard print around it. So elaborate camps with chandeliers and pianos and whatnot. But it's also a place of flex where, a place of flex where like, you can um, choose your own initiative and run with it. Uh, 10 years ago, you'll notice several of the fortress people are carrying around cups um, and uh, what we call biscuits and buskets so where you put your uh, drink into it. Uh, 10 years ago, they decided to get rid of cups to eliminate trash, and that was one person in the initiative. This is Jesse and his twin brother decided to make murals in all the porta potties, so it was a kind of beautifying thing. Now, within this last year, uh, composting and uh, requiring all the camps to use compostable plates. So uh, there can be a lot of uh, change uh, and kind of progressive uh, sentimentality. Um, so I'm using a large uh, 4x5 field camera, so it's very large camera with very extended bellows on top of a tripod. And um, one of the greatest things that I get to do is I get to walk around and kind of find these people in, in their situation, situations. This is Happy Jack uh, and his coffee bus. Happy Jack hasn't been back. Um, he had uh, open heart surgery and he can't stand the heat anymore, unfortunately. But he also will embroider your um, Kerrville nickname onto your Kerr shirt. Um, so I'm Photo Dave. Uh, 
uh, and everybody knows me with my camera, and they'll say, hey, photo Dave, let me get a portrait. And so, um, but I also get their stories of how long they've been here. A lot of my friends have been at the festival uh, since their parents were dating, and they showed up in, Euro in utero and have gone every year since. Um, this is uh, Matt and Squares. Uh, they are the heads of security two years ago. Um, they also have a school bus, which is the pirate ship. So if you wanted to go drink some rum and party with them, they're mostly open to it. Um, but it's also interesting, the festival's over 30,000 people over the 18 days. So trying to find a certain individual can be a little bit difficult. I've been wanting to photograph Squares and her pirate regalia for uh, many years, and it took me three years to find her at the time that I had my camera and that she was able to pose. Um, this is Raina Lee. Uh, plays in a band called The Lovelies. Uh, every day is a theme day at Kerrville. On the fifth day of Kerrville, it's Curdy Graw. On the thirteenth day of Kerrville, it's Curloween. Um, if you're uh, the first time you go to Kerrville, you're considered a curvert. Or the first time you go, you're a curvergen. The second time you go, you're a curvert. If you go for 18 days, you're a curviver. Um, uh, Generally, I only have a window to photograph between about 4 o'clock and 8.30 at night. That's when it's not hot, not too hot, uh, and the light's pretty much right. But during the daytime, most people go to the Spring Fred Medina. And as we all know, Texas flooded during Memorial Day weekend. I was on a tent in a campsite while it was flooding. Uh, There's two days where we couldn't get past the low water crossing, uh, which caused for some anxiety for some people. Um, and this is the Medina River, which is the Spring Fred River in the Texas Hill Country. So a lot of times you'll find that people during the daytime go down the river to cool off. Um, and it's a big part of the experience. Um, after the, going to the river, most people go down to the meadow. And the meadow is where most of the people camp. Um, a lot of times the campsite will host a festival dinner to where there's Ficky to Thursday or uh, Corn Dog Friday, where everybody on the ranch who needs to get fed can get fed. So there's a sense of watering. Uh, the nightlife, that's when most people come out. That's when the uh, elaborate campsites, kind of uh, the Christmas lights and uh, the decorations. But also you'll start seeing live performances where uh, it's a very fluid uh, participation in performance where somebody with a mandolin will walk down the uh, their gravel road and there will be somebody with a banjo and they'll swap a song and next thing you know you have bass players and fiddle players and 10 other people playing songs. Um, and then you'll find that you're having a gathering of 100 or so people going around the festival. Um, so more room for questions. That's my website, David Johnson Studio, um, where you can see all my artwork. And pickers.com is where you can see all the work that I've done, an unedited version of all the work that I've done in Kerrville. Um, right now, uh, because of the grant and because of the critical mass, which thank everyone for, I was able to raise funds to make rents, but also I went to Chicago to promote this project as a book idea, um, and I've been working on that. I just got back um, Thursday after shooting 240 new images and portraits, so I'm very excited. So within the next three months, we'll see some new work coming out. Any questions? What format camera do you shoot with? What format camera do you it's shoot with? It's a 4x5 with? field camera. It's a Wista. It's, so it's... um. It, all the designs come from about the 1880s to 1920s. It's uh, all wood with brass trimmings. Uh, it's really, it's very easy to get somebody to stop and pose for you when you have such a nice piece of equipment like that. Any other questions? Great. Thank you all. Critical Mass and to Sheldon. It's great to have my work shown here. It is great to get the recognition of this uh, grant. Um, my uh, recent work is based on trees in many different ways, which I'll talk about. How do I make it go forward? This? Okay. Um, but I also wanted to just say quickly that uh, I live on the Illinois side of the world. Ah. And uh, it is, um, and 
I live six and a half hours from Chicago, so I really, St. Louis has, I've worked here for 20 years, and it's my place to come. Uh, I have many, many friends here and uh, um, really love St. Louis. So uh, I'm very glad that Critical Mass had this kind of uh, area around Metro St. Louis that they support. Um, so us Illinois folks love Critical Mass. Thank you very much. So anyway, since 1992, my husband, who's an artist, his name is Jerry Monteith, and I have lived um, in a small town uh, on the Illinois side. We, we bought an old farmhouse and renovated it. And we're right on the edge of the Shawnee National Forest. And this is my son in the um, meadow behind our house. Um, we haven't really farmed the land. It hasn't been farmed for about 30 years. Um, but I do keep a garden, and my husband has a very large collection of indigenous trees on our property. Um, now, the town that we live in was founded in 1859, but the Shawnee National Forest didn't happen until the 1930s. And it really happened because it uh, reforest, re, hardly say this, reforestation was necessary. Southern Illinois, which had been a big timber area, was essentially deforested by agriculture and by the timber harvest. Um, unfortunately, there's, uh, there's hardly any old growth uh, trees left, but there are many uh, new trees growing, and it is very beautiful. Oh, wait, let me go back down here. Go back. Oh. So the Shawnee National Forest goes from this edge of Illinois all the way around here, so it covers the entire bottom of the state. And it was set up around all these little towns that were already there. Um, this is one of the great giants of the park. This is the Cache River Wetlands um, Canoe Trail. Um, but you can see it's a big old cypress tree, and then there's a lot of new growth around it. by the strange way that they grow. This is an American hot corn bean. It's also called a mussel tree because the shapes that it gets itself into look like human musculature. Um, and it really looks, these trees look human um, very often. Um, I've done a whole series of drawings on graph paper, eight and a half by 11, that are about trees. Um, most of them pretty simple pencil drawings with a little paint sometimes. Um, and this one, it, it, it deals with this whole issue of uh, the trees looking almost human. Um, I'm also interested in the way trees interact with each other. So these are two trees that have grown around each other. And um, this is a series of drawings I did called Two Dancers. What did I do? I did something. Oh, thank you. And um, it's based on Robert Earl King Jr., who's one of my favorite uh, musicians. So, um, I'm interested in what happens to trees when they get insect damage, how they respond, and how they fight back against it. Also, disease, how they fight against what humans have done to it. I think this tree was probably pollarded at one time, which means that all the major branches are cut to the same height, and it adapted and then just kept on growing. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this tree, is a uh, wasp tree, um, is about the interaction between trees and wasps, but it's also about a storm that basically denuded this young tree we had on our property. And when it did that, we realized there was a huge wasp nest in it. And what I did with this idea was I just multiplied it. And um, my drawings that I do, they look pretty realistic. They're very detailed. 
but the images are actually compilations of two or three different species of trees, and I, I, I like to play with tree characteristics, like you know, modify them in some way, exaggerate them, or make them more complicated. I also like them to be a little bit menacing because I want to give nature, a, a, remind us that nature can fight back, and it can fight back really hard. It can easily kill us. Um, Okay, so the trees also have, in their natural state, very bizarre characteristics. On the left is a sycamore uh, bark that looks like camouflage, then a, a paper birch, um, which just naturally grows that way, and then a hackberry, which, um, let's see if I can do this. If you turn this on this side and, and blew it up a million times, it's like the Grand Canyon in here. It's almost like an architectural structure or a rock formation. Um, so here's a piece. I did a lot of drawings about tree bark and just playing with the idea of tree bark and how it could be manipulated. Um, so my interest in trees is long-standing, like I said, but it, I really started focusing on drawing trees after I experienced a, a major storm with 106 mile an hour winds that went through uh, many of the towns going from east to west between uh, deep southern Illinois. Um, this is a picture I took in Carbondale, which is fairly near us. Uh, they lost 3,000 trees in that storm, and nobody died, uh, which was good. But it was a very, very scary storm, and um, it really changed my relationship to trees completely. Uh, this is a maple tree that was outside um, our home at, uh, and uh, half of it just fell. And if you'll notice this poor little blue thing under here, that's my car. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I, I wasn't in it at the time, but I saw it happen. It was pretty scary. So um, I, even though it was frightening to see these huge, like three-ton oak trees fall. Um, while I was staying there, I also felt horrible uh, just driving around all the fallen trees over and over, all over the place, all over where I lived. And I wanted to like go and put bandages around them and stand them back up again. Uh, and so that's when I that's when I began working on some very large scale drawings of trees. I also wanted to give people the sense of how big trees are. You know, we don't think about it very much. And they're really nice and shady and they blow in the wind and stuff, but if they fall on you, they're very big. So this is this drawing is 38 feet long. Um, and as you can see, I, I drew bandages on it and sort of tried to prop it back up again and sort of start to get it um, back alive. <coughs> Uh, this is a work in progress, something I'm doing right now. Um, it's seven feet tall here, so I come to about right there. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be eventually about 48 feet long. It's a tree that is kind of rotating through the seasons of the year. So this is winter here and goes into spring and then into summer. And I'm, that's where I'm at. I'm at summer right now. But I, I haven't got it as dense as I want it to be yet. Um, but this gives you a little better idea. I'm sorry this is out of focus. I uh, literally took it as I was running out the door. <laughs> um, so that, that's something I'm, I'm hoping to show in the near future. Um, the work that's in this show I call the Roma series, and it's it's drawings of trees on graph paper. I began working on this series. I'm still working on it, but I began working on it during a residency I did at a place called Palazzo Rinaldi, which is located in Noepoli in far southern Italy, um, just like I live in deep southern Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, like my town, oh, whoops, come back. Giving away all my good stuff. Oh no! Wait a minute. There we go. Um, okay, so Noepoli is located 
right <coughs> out there, and that's the National Park, uh, Parco Nacionale Polino, that was formed, um, again, because of reforestate, reforestation needs. And like the Shawnee, there's very few old growth trees. But the few trees that I did see, it, um, I began to really uh, wonder about them. Um, like my town, uh, with the exception of the mountains, we don't have mountains in southern Illinois. But, uh, uh, um, the, the park was formed around towns. But it had a lot of the exact same uh, flora and fauna that we have um, at the Shawnee National Forest. Um, my work that I did in Italy was very strongly influenced by a couple of different things. One was the question, what have these old growth trees seen in their lifetimes? I mean, they went from being seedlings to being old growth trees um, through thousands of years of civilization. Um, so, uh, I have to thank Lindsay Scott. Anybody know Lindsay? Yay! For this photograph, which, oh, come back here, which was perfect, uh, as you'll see. Um, but this was on her email that she sends out. But anyway, the Shawnee National Forest was also home to ancient civilizations, very different ancient civilizations, but Mississippian uh, Native American populations lived uh, near where I live. Um, my town that I live in was established in 1859, but the archaeologists and the rangers in the park had found all kinds of strange things embedded in trees, um, like arrowheads and bullets and cut nails and barbed wire, old signs, chunks of pottery, <coughs> and chunks of china. Um, things grow very fast where I live, it's like living in a jungle. Um, Trees have both grown up, around, and through houses and whole um, structures. Um, and they have, have recently found an entire African-American town called Miller's Crossing that they're um, trying to clear the brush out of. But the brush had just completely overwhelmed it. Um, so I just began to ma imagine what the trees in Italy had seen, what they had been through. Um, before heading down to southern Italy for my residency, I visited Naples and Rome and the ruins at Pompeii with my husband and my son. Um, we all know Pompeii was buried in se uh, 79 AD, okay, so there, a lot of the artwork was done around that time or uh, before then. Um, we decided, since there's so much to see in Italy, we decided to focus on sort of ancient Roman art and architecture, um, the things that we would uh, go to see. And so that's my second major influence with this work that's in the show, is, is um, the uh, Roman art and architecture. I had done uh, my MFA many, many, many years ago. <laughs> But I did my, my MFA thesis on Roman wall painting as installation art. But I had never seen any of the Roman wall paintings. So going to Pompeii, and this is in the Villa of Mysteries, was a great, um, great pleasure for me. Um, there are essentially four different wall painting styles in uh, Roman wall painting. But as the years on, went on, the, the painting got more and more austere and more and more simple. They started out with very realistic human forms and trying to create trompe l'oeil feeling of depth. Um, and as it went on, uh, the, everything got flatter and simpler or more abstract. So this is kind of a combination, but it's essentially a fourth style uh, room, also in the Villa of uh, Mysteries. I also fell in love with a lot of the masonry work um, this is a tufa, and tufa is a lava made stone, and brickwork column that I thought was beautiful. But the, the, the people of Pompeii also loved trompe l'oeil columns. So here what is what was underneath the main center of town, big columns, okay, bricks. But they covered it with stucco to make it look like marble. So they were into the trompe l'oeil in many different ways. Um, I also fell in love with these um, 
the grinding stones that millers would use in their bakeries, and then, of course, the beautiful um, tile work in Pompeii. Uh, another influence was the animal life that I saw both in urban and, and ancient sites. Um, there were many lizards in Pompeii crawling around and skittering over your feet, but I think they were really beautiful. A lot of geckos and a lot of birds. So all of that you'll see in the work. This is, oh, this is no athlete. <sighs> Medieval hill fort town, uh, way down in the south of Italy, and uh, this is the street, the, the way the streets are in the town. So it's a beautiful place. Basilicata and a lot of southern Italy is becoming very popular, so we should go there now before. We get <coughs> um, okay, so I think you can get the idea of where the work in the show came from. Um, but just to be clear, like on the left is a tree, a column tree, where the tree, like bark of trees, has sort of taken on the aspects of the Roman tile work. And then on the right is a tree that's grown over a whole column of um, blue and yellow tiles. Um, so the, this tree on the left, this is called fourth style tree, so it's obvious what that comes from. And then on the right is a, a, a column with a, a huge sort of raven-like bird that has the two-foot and brick um, structure. And this is the most recent of the work I've done that's in the show. And so this is basically a tree um, growing up through a tiled structure and then pushing up this miller's stone up into the edge. And that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, I think we have refreshments upstairs. Thank you very much, guys.